going to apologise. There's good news and there's bad news. Uh, the good news is you've got a new original talk. There are some slides in here, some of you have seen before, but a lot of this is completely new. The bad news is you've got a new and original talk, <laughs> which means when it comes to timing, bugs, typos, my jokes, they're not quite positioned yet, you know. So um, there's been a few earlier incarnations of this, but th this, is, this is largely new, this stuff. And in fact, as some of you saw, I just quickly changed the word paradigms to heuristics. Uh, I think I originally wanted to put heuristics on here, um, but you know, paradigms is so much more of a serious word, and we must hide the fact that we're using intuition. Uh, hide that, don't, don't let anyone know that. Um, it's great that Gert managed to tie the use of intuition to waste, because you know, we all love getting rid of waste. It's the only thing about lean that most CXOs understand, eliminate waste. So your decision making is wasteful, use your intuition. Um, I, what I want to get to is some things in here where I think there's some intuition, some heuristics, some paradigms that we aren't really appreciating. Um, a lot of my thinking, I, I kind of find it a little bit frustrating. You know? I go and I do consulting and training with companies. Uh, I, I do conference talks and people always want those little nuggets, those little practical things I can do. They, they want those little things which, what can I actually do tomorrow? You know, they, they want, if you can say to them, well, instead of starting your user stories as a user, maybe you should start as a somebody other than a user. They, they, they want those little things. And actually, so much of this comes down to those thousands and millions of decisions you make every day without thinking which are based on your internal mental models, your heuristics, the way you see the world. This isn't about those little nuggets of practical things you can do. This is about rewiring your mental models of the world, your heuristics, your intuition. So your intuition is giving you the right decisions. Um, so by now you all know who I am, so I don't need to give you the obligatory slide on, on who I am and how I, I write lots of books and uh, you know, one day my books will pay the mortgage, uh, but until I start writing about Harry Potter, that isn't going to happen. Um, I want to write this digital thing. Um, digital. Um, I guess I, I, I've been digital since about the age of 12 when I got a ZX81. And I, I've always lived in that world. And, and so about, about, what, seven, eight, maybe 10 years ago, when people started talking about digital and these digital agencies appeared, it's like, uh, so what? Those analog computers have never really caught on. They're pretty limited application. And the Steam-based ones as well, you know, you, there's that one in the Science Museum, but you know, they didn't catch on. Um, so it's like, what is the, you know, why are you even using the word digital? It's just a waste of, you know, two vowels. Uh, just cut it out, it's all the same. And it was only about a year or two ago, I realized this word digital actually means something. It doesn't mean anything for me, and it doesn't mean anything for most of you in this room who, like me, have been immersed in the world of these binary Intel devices for decades. The word means to all those people, unlike us, who didn't grow up with one of these things, they've now come to our world. Our world, where everything is reduced to source code, we have version control systems, we have instantaneous communication, we have you know, all, all the stuff we are so used to that we don't even think about it. Or at least all the programmers down in, on, on the, and downstairs think. All that stuff which is so natural. When people outside the technology field use the word digital, what they are saying is their world now looks like our world. The business, which used to be selling pies, is now a digital pie business. And they've got to think about source code control systems and source code and usability and a God knows what else. What digital means is everybody else's world looks like our world. And I'm going to try and tell you that digital and agile are not only joined at the hip, they are one and the same thing. Um, so welcome to Planet Digital. We now all live on Planet Digital. You, you've all got more processing power and communication power in your pocket than Neil and Buzz took to the moon. They also took a couple of bugs to the moon. The Apollo lander had two bugs. If they fixed either of them, the two of them would have slammed into the moon and they'd be dead. Fortunately, the two bugs cancelled each other out. 
They only fixed them in time for Apollo 13, but didn't get to test them on Apollo 13. Yeah? That's another thing about our digital world. It's, it's kind of imperfect. Um, so welcome to Planet Digital. Um, and when we say digital, we're talking about CPU power, memory chip power, which often comes down to transistors. How many transistors can you squeeze into a given amount of space? This is Moore's law. You all know Moore's law? CPU or transistor count per millimeter, whatever, doubles every 18 months to two years, and the price halves. That's a rough proxy for CPU power. So uh, here we are. Back here in the Intel 4004. Any of you come across the 4004? Pan, it used to be in a lot of traffic light systems. This, this is the first CPU as we would recognize it today. Um, the first, instantation, first instance of the 8080 um, instruction set. There's my favorite 6502. I grew up with a BBC after my, my ZX81. Any, anyone here like off Apple II? Commodore 64, three and a half thousand transistors. Wow. <laughs> yeah, this is proof the Z80 was better. Had twice as many transistors. The Spectrum, the uh, the Oric, was it the Oric or the Jupiter Ace, you know, that this machine. Oh. Um, it wasn't until you get to, well, two years ago, the Intel Broadwell, 7.2 billion transistors, yeah? Uh, for comparison, Neil had about 35,000 in the Apollo guidance computer. Um, all of this is long tail. If you're old enough like me to remember the dot-com boom, the dot-com boom is insignificant. It's down here, oops, go back, down here in the long tail. And of course, if I was to update this graph, this is logarithmic, by the way, just in case you hadn't noticed. This is logarithmic. You know, if we put another point up there for this year's, you know, we're going to lose this down into the long tail. Um, you know, this is just going to keep on going up and up and up. This is what digital is. This is these CPU cycles. This is what's driving digital. Um, that we have so many CPUs and also the dirt cheap. Uh, ubiquitous, cheap CPU cycles are changing the world. Those of you who had a Z80, a 6502, maybe even a 68000, you've grown up with this. You've got masses more power, but that power is pretty irrelevant to many people. Only now we've got so much more. Can it, it do things? You know, are we really using it? Um, as a result, it's changing business. The businesses you work for, overwhelmingly, if you're working for a growth business, and I hope you're working for a growth business, the other type aren't too good to work for. Uh, yeah, overwhelmingly, growth businesses are driven by this. CPU power, information technology, digital, call it what you like. For example, did you know John Deere, the tractor company, is now a digital business? Um, this was sometime last year, they bought a Silicon Valley company that specialised in algorithms for farmers to make the, tra the self-driving tractors put down fertiliser more efficiently. Um, this is my favourite. Rental kill is a digital business. The company that comes around and kills your rat infestations, now their rat traps are internet of things devices and their rat traps report there are more rats in Falmouth than there was last week, which means they can send down the rat killers, but they can send down more rat killers when there's dozens more rats, not thousands more rats, and therefore they send fewer rat killers, and fewer rats have to be killed. Yeah. Since when was rat killing? Where, where's that feature in the, in the Pied Piper Hamlin? Yeah. Where, where does a computer come into that? Yeah. These CPU cycles are getting everywhere. We can't avoid them. Um, so when we say digital, you know, we're talking about a lot of technologies here driven by these CPU cycles. The web, online retail, smart media, mobile phones. This is the kind of stuff you think of immediately you know, when we talk about digital. GPS. There are some people who argue that GPS is a more significant invention than the internet. 
I mean, the two usually work together, but GPS alone, some people would argue, is more significant. And they would also argue that as humans, we're losing our ability to navigate mentally because we're becoming so dependent on these things. They're changing our brains. Apps, the gig economy, Uberization. Because we have mobile phones, we have a lot of CPU power in them, we can have apps. Those apps can allow us to do a new type of business model, which is called Uberization, where you've got lots of independent people, and you can organize them. But it goes on, cloud, smart media, crowdfunding, big data, robotics, drones, smart, 3D printing, internet of things, LiDAR, AI, deep learning, you know. And I'm sure you can think of some that I haven't put on here. These technologies are all driven by more CPU cycles because CPU power is increasing while cost is coming down. And take, go back to those smartphones for a minute. One of the effects of this, CPU cycles are getting more smartphones which need to consume low amounts of battery and pack everything into a small area. That technology is now being used for sensors you can put into the ocean to monitor the, the, the ocean. You can put a, a lot of sensors into the ocean and let them drift and they can report back data on currents and ocean changes. We're able to monitor things in a way we weren't able to because of these technologies and the side effects of them. And Agile makes this all possible. Could you imagine doing half of these things? Can you imagine doing crowdfunding on a waterfall model? Can you show me your Gantt chart for crowdfunding? Well, we're going to post it up on uh, our platform of choice. What, what, who is, who, anyone here from Newquay? The, uh, who's the crowdfunding company in Newquay? Uh, we're going to post it up and we're going to get loads of people to sign up. And then in six months' time, in three months' time, when everyone signed up and we got the money, like, yeah. Um, rapid release cycles. If we don't have rapid release cycles, you can't get the power of digital. You know, you can't say to people in this world, oh, well, write it all down, and in six months' time, we'll give you something to look at. Yeah? So rapid release cycles. Um, testing the market with lean startup. You know, we'll put something, we'll probe the market. It's a complex, or it's a complicated environment. We don't understand it. We've got some heuristics. We'll probe the market. We'll understand it. We'll refine it. We'll pivot. Could you imagine doing that with a Gantt chart? Yeah? Get on the Gantt chart, you could tell me which tests are going to work and which are going to fail. Yeah? Technology teams working with business speed up our iterations. We want the technology people and the business people sitting together. Because every time somebody from this side of the room has to stand up, walk over this side of the room, find somebody who's not at their desk, walk back, poll them, send them a text to say, Mr. Businessman, can you give me some feedback on what we've seen? You slow it down. You want to speed it up. Th these are natural to agile, but without things like this and more, can you be a digital business? Could you imagine being a digital business following the waterfall? Does not compute, like most of our major banks. Um, so Planet Digital is built on cheap CPU cycles, lots of software, and Agile. Agile and digital are hand in hand, the same thing. Um, there's a model of technology change, which has been around for years. Um, and this is what it says. There's three stages to technology change. In the first, you get a new technology, and it allows you to do the same thing as you were doing before faster. Right? You can take your technology. It allows you to keep on working the way you were. You're like getting a taxi. You know, when you first get Uber on your phone, you stop picking up the phone. You, you book something through Uber just like you did before, but it's kind of like faster, more convenient. You know when the taxi's going to be there. Over time, as you get used to it, you change your processes. You change the way you do things. So one of the things that's happening in London and other big cities at the moment is the usage of public transport is going down. Even as TfL and LA public transportation, people like that are investing record sums, usage is going down because people are using Ubers and similar things more. One of the problems in London is there's more people using taxis rather than getting on the tube. People are changing their processes because technology has made it easier to get a taxi. They're getting a taxi rather than getting on the tube. Therefore, TfL's got to start thinking about how they're going to cope with that. Are they going to change the road layouts or just ban Uber? Yeah. So, first of all, new technology causes us to do the same thing faster. Then we start to change our processes the way we work. And that 
leads to more innovation. When you get process changes, you can see another innovation that you can do. I'll give you an example. Um, I was in a, conf a conference in um, Estonia last year, and the man who had been CTO of Estonia, yeah, Estonia has a CTO, um, talked about how the way they introduced a system so you could register a new business and set up a new business within 24 hours, which is great because, you know, we all need new businesses like really quick. Um, but there is one group of people who found that very, very useful. Fraudsters. <laughs> so first of all, people created new businesses more fast. And then the fraudsters realised that actually they could do this for VAT fraud. They could change the way they did VAT fraud and they could set up a lot of companies very easily, pass goods between them and perpetrate VAT fraud. So now Estonia needed a new innovation. They needed to get everybody to log contracts and payments, I think it's over 5,000 euros. So they've had to innovate again to stamp out VAT fraud. Yeah, challenge, respond. You do something, you see what happens, somebody else takes it further. Um, and, um, and basically then just, just repeat. Now, there's a good example of this with electricity. If you step back, well, 100 years, your factories were pretty much like this. I think this is a picture from Siemens. The important thing to note here is this. This is a bus, this is a piece of metal, it's called a bus, and turns around. It's driven by a steam engine, or perhaps a water wheel, or some other mechanism that makes movement. Off here, you have belts. The belts drive the machines. Before electricity, this is how you organised your factory. You laid out your machines so they could have access to the bus. There's some more buses in, in here as well. There was problems because if the belts were too long, they broke. There was speed problems with the machines because of the belt tolerances, etc., etc., And because, of course, they can only go in straight lines, your factory layout was limited, right? And then we got electricity. Now, these machines could have their own movement device, and the movement device, you, you lost limitations like the belt, so you could run the machines faster. So factories could operate more rapidly because they had electricity driving these machines rather than a belt. Which is great, isn't it? Everything's happening faster. But remember, there's process change. So factories needed redesign. Now, that takes time. You know, factories have been built. You need to think about, and some of them are built very long to get the buses in. You need to redesign your factories. You need to move your machines about. And you may notice these, these, machi oops, go back. these machines are not particularly light, so if you want to move them about. <laughs> It, it's kind of difficult, yeah? So first of all, you need to redesign your factories, you need to retool your machines, and you need to change, then you can start to change your processes. Because while you're using a bus, there are limitations to how you organise your processes, because you need to have the machines near the bus. So the handoff from one machine to another machine isn't so significant as where you get access to the bus. Does anyone see where this is going? So those stages where we hand products off to other people for other operations, a lot of it comes from the position of the bus and getting your machine to get some power. With electricity, you can reposition the machines. You can put the machines anywhere because those cables are pretty flexible. So now you need to think about how you lay out your machines to minimise handovers, to create an efficient process, to um, perhaps change the machines you're using, change the processes you're following? Yes? Does this sound um, like lean? Arguably, you know, Toyota, we love all that, but arguably, lean is actually a result of electricity. Because remember the other thing, we forget, when we talk about Toyota in the, the 40s and the 50s, what else happened in Japan? Same thing happened in Germany. You rebuilt. There was nothing, or oh, there's a lot. There's a lot of nothing. Uh, yeah, they, when when Toyota started to rebuild their factories after the war, they could build them with electricity from the word go. General Motors and Ford and so on were still trying to adapt the Rouge and other places to electricity, so they had the processes which came from the bus. So electricity comes along. Electricity allows you to do the same thing faster. Then over time, you can start to rethink your processes. So, when did General Motors get lean? Around 1990, shall we say? Give or take a few years. When did General Motors get electricity? 
I don't know, 1920? Yeah? There can be a long time lag. Be a long time lag between those technology changes and really getting the full benefit from them because you've got so much sunk costs, you've got so much infrastructure, so many assets wired to doing things the old way. This is also one of the problems we have with national productivity statistics. That in the 90s, we couldn't see increased productivity in our economy, small money we were spending on technology. And now we can't see the increased productivity from social media. It's, it's not there in the statistics. Economists are struggling with this. We haven't yet seen the process changes to match the technologies. So there you go. Technology changes faster than we change the process. So that's the past. As Admiral Grace Hooper says, let's talk about the future. What does the future look like on Planet Digital? What do the processes look like? Fortunately, we have some examples, some early adopters of digital technology. You, the people downstairs, me, remember my ZX81, my BBC Micro? Those of us in the development community have been living with these technologies for a long time. We are the prototype of future workers. So what does that tell you about our new processes? The processes we need to match digital, they are called? Agile, thank you very much. Agile, yeah, we know it's not about software development. Agile, forget all that other stuff. Agile is the process that matches digital technology. We saw it first with software developers because software developers had access to technology first. Marketing is really interesting. There are quite a few studies now, and we've had people at this conference speak about agile in marketing. And probably marketing is the place where you hear about agile more often than anywhere else outside software development. What's happened to marketing in the last 10 years? Social media. Marketing has been recreated in the last 10 years because of social media. And look what's happening. Marketing people are adopting agile-like processes. Agile is the process that accompanies digitization. Digitization allows you to do the same thing faster. Agile gives you the tools to change the process to maximize return on that digitization. That's why we're seeing Agile spread out as other people become digital, as other domains increasingly use our digital technologies. Agile processes unlock more value from digitization. You can adopt the digital process like our banks do. You can give people banking apps. You can do the same thing faster with fewer people, but only when you change the process do you get the full benefit. That's why fintech is starting to change things. That's why fintech is a place to watch. So I want to try and give you some heuristics, four heuristics for what this means for the world going forward. And this fits quite nicely in what Smagerd was saying. Plan less, release more. You know, planning, you know, all that kind of um, get a report to back up your intuition. Yeah, do less of the planning, do more of the releasing, because when you release more, when you get into the market, when you see what's happening, it informs what you're doing. Founder LinkedIn said, um, if you're not embarrassed by your first release, you've released too late. Bear in mind, planning is learning, and I'm all for learning, and planning is a form of learning. However, it follows this kind of graph. A little bit of planning, small amount of time, you are learning a lot. The first hour of planning, you're learning a lot. Standing around the whiteboard with your colleagues for a couple of hours, you are learning a lot. This is very effective and very beneficial. However, you quickly get to a point where more planning does not add more value. Early last year, I sat in a room at a large bank with a dozen senior project managers, business analysts, architect, and representatives from their outsourcer, and we spent two hours debating user stories for OAuth authentication, which were going to go to the outsourcer to be estimated. We said, I could have written that in a day. My OAuth is just about there. I'm sure their development teams, a couple of developers could have knocked out in half a day. But no, they put 12 people in a room. I was there for two hours. They were there for most of the day. They had got to the point 
where more planning was reducing value because they were over planning, they were over analyzing. This fits in with what Summer Gerd was saying. So, planning has, in economic terms, rapidly diminishing returns. The first couple of hours of planning, really, really useful. Then you get to a point where you're not really adding value. Then you get to a point where actually you're running in circles. You're detracting value. So some of my favorite slides, I have to put these in every presentation now. Um, some of you may remember this machine. This is an IBM 360. Uh, the world was black and white then. Um, so um, I, I, I was just about around when these were new. I was in nappies though. Um, 10 MIPS. I'm surprised they even had the idea. Well, they called it 10,000 KIPS. <laughs> 4 mega RAM. I was surprised when I looked this up how much computing power they had in 1970. A COBOL on that. Anyone programming COBOL? Yeah. Are you currently programming COBOL? No. <laughs> well, why is that? Well, what, what, what's wrong with COBOL then? Yeah? Uh, IMS database. We know good things come around again. Hierarchical database is brilliant. Um, this is the important number. You rented these from IBM for a quarter of a million US. In 2016 prices, that's 1.25 million rent. Uh, the reason why this is um, based on 2016 is because in 2016, I bought my children one of these. <laughs> OK, 474 times more power, 256 more times Open source operating. You did not have open source in 1970 because nobody went home and hacked open source. Um, yeah, Scala, Ruby, you could probably program COBOL on these, but I, I've never heard of anyone doing it. Uh, SQL, no SQL. Now look here. What we can take from this, economics, aid. economics, economics is all about relative pricing. In 1970, CPU cycles were very, very expensive. In 1970, it makes a lot of sense to analyze the hell out of this and speak to everybody you can before you use a CPU cycle, because you can't have to put on a punch card, aren't you? And the reason why I say of 1970 is what else happened in 1970? What was published in 1970? The waterfall. the waterfall paper. Royce's waterfall paper was written in 1970. The process described in the waterfall paper, traditional software development and all that we learned at college, dates from 1970 and before. The processes, so this is the argument for Agile, forget all the other arguments. The argument for 1970 is the alternative process dates from 1970. Remember what I said? Technology allows you to do things faster, and then you change the processes. Agile is the process that matches modern technology. Waterfall is a process that matches 1970s technology. If you're programming in COBOL on IBM 360, I suggest you use Waterfall. Um, in this world, in the Raspberry Pi world, CPU cycles are so ridiculously cheap, planning is expensive. An hour spent planning is far more expensive than the CPU cycles you burn. In 1970, an hour of planning cost you 36,000 CPU cycles. In 1926, uh, 2016, an hour of planning cost you 17 million processor cycles. Okay? Planning is much more expensive in, in 2016 than in 1970. Therefore, wherever you can, replace planning with doing. Because doing is also learning. Doing is learning. You're actually in there and you're doing stuff. You're seeing what happens. You're testing the market. Lean startup. You're writing little tests. TDD. <gasps> oh, <laughs> funny me. Um, yeah, so a lot of these ideas have been knocking around in one form or another since, since 1980. Yeah years back. Um, Ari de Goose was um, the head of planning at Shell. He wrote this book, 1988. Com the understand the only competitive advantage of the company of the future, and we are living in the future now, this book is 30 years ago, is the manager's ability to faster than their competitors. In a moment, I'm going to tell you that all of you, and even the people down listening to Liz in a technical track, are managers. When Ari was talking about managers, he was actually talking about you. So, what is the fastest way to learn? Planning, doing.
doing or other, please specify. What, what do you want to do? Yeah? Iterate. We do a bit of planning, a couple of hours at the whiteboard, do something, back to the whiteboard, reflect, what have we learned? We want to iterate these two things. Planning is learning, doing is learning. Do them both, and it's cheap to do them both, unlike 1970. <sighs> planning is learning, planning is valuable, but planning is expensive. That room I sat at at the big bank with a dozen senior BAs and project managers, in it, that was hideously expensive. If they didn't demand an outsourcing anything, they could have got a couple of people to do it that afternoon. Planning has rapidly diminishing returns. <sighs> That's number one. Take from this, by the way, if you want to finish earlier, start sooner. In the olden days, we thought if we, we, could, if we planned it correctly, we could optimise it later on. Uh, now, we want to finish earlier, we get doing. Okay. <sighs> Number two, do it right, then do the right thing. Okay. Yesterday, we used to say, do it right. Decide what the right thing is. And then number two, do it right. Now, at, at this point, um, most people in management circles do not believe I have any credibility. <laughs> uh, I'm driving a coach and horses through one of the most sacred cows of management. At this point, I have to point out, I, unlike them, have an MBA with distinction. <laughs> this gives me a license of bullshit. <laughs> okay. uh, some of you have seen me give this, but I love this slide. It's 10 years old now, but I love it. Survey from Bain. 74% of companies are in the maintenance zone. This, this, this is, by the way, um, less effective IT, more effective IT. Doing things right, you can think of this. This is business strategy. IT, highly aligned to the business. IT, less aligned to the business. Doing things right. 74% of companies are maintenance zone. Average IT spending, 74% of companies, what do you expect? Sales are, are falling. And equally, as you expect, a few companies, IT enable growth. IT spending's down. Sales, go, go, sales. Yeah, that's where you want to be. Okay, so the other two quadrants are the interesting ones. Well-oiled IT. 8% of companies, IT spending is lowest here. Hey, those sales are going up 10% a year. But go back to our management dicta, our management maxim. These guys are doing things right, but they're not necessarily doing the right thing. These guys are breaking the management dicta of do it right and then do the right thing. Ah, so if the management dicta maxim is right, we should expect this to be the best, second best place, right? So this place up here is going to be better than well maintenance and well-oiled but not as good as enable growth, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll let that sink in. Okay. Second largest group of company, IT spending has really gone up and sales are nose diving. Doing things right, ineffectively, is a worse place to be than not doing the right things badly. The worst possible place to be is doing the right thing badly. Why is this? Well, if you read the original Bain argument, they'll tell you that you should be using SOA. SOA. Do you remember that stuff? Um, when, when I read the argument, when I read the article, what I read is that companies here, so this is reading the article and my observation, I think companies here try to do the right thing and then try to do it right. So the first thing they do is bulk up on business analysts to make sure they do the right thing. And then they bulk up on project managers to make sure nobody does the wrong thing. Uh, and they're all hungry mouths that need to be paid, uh, but planning costs have gone through the roof. And it's cheaper to do than it is to plan. So, you know, in, in agile terms, agile helps us move there. Agile helps us do the right thing, but not necessarily... Oh, agile helps us do things right, not so much the right thing. That's kind of the second phase of agile adoption. So um, you come across Humphrey's Law. Users don't know what they want until they see it. Yeah. Which, for you and me, poses the question, how do I know what the right thing is? 
management maxim, do the right thing. How do you know what the right thing is if users don't know it till they see it? How many of you knew you needed this much power, 280 character messaging system in your pocket, email, call a taxi? How many of you knew you needed that before you saw it? And that's not even an iPhone. Iterate, what a surprise. Do something, see what happens, see what people want, keep going. So, do the right thing. Let me rewrite this. Let me not be so contrarian. Do the right thing. The right thing to do is to build a machine that can iterate. And that means building an effective machine that can do things in the right way. Build a machine that can iterate and then do it right. Iterate your way to the right thing. Do not spend forever in planning and analysis sessions trying to work out what the right thing is and then do it right. Build yourself a machine that will give you the answer to that question an iterating, test-driven, lean start or pivoting machine. <sighs> Three, it's an Agile conference. Can't have an Agile conference without being Japanese. <laughs> you know Kanban, you know Kaizen, you even know Kakaku. John, what was your word last year? Kuroki. Kuroki, uh, death by overwork. Yeah, it's a problem at Toyota. Kenning Kai Kai, yes. Yeah. Kenning Kai Kai should be your maxim. Uh, I get Kenning Kai Kai, um, it means every, ma every person a manager. It comes from my friends at Uniqlo. I don't think Uniqlo in Falmouth, but many of you know they're on Regent Street, they're around. Cheap fashion, Japanese Zara. Um, from their um, HR documentation, Zen in Kai Kai, under which every employee adopts the mindset of a business manager, regardless of his or her position. Okay. What does Agile say about managers, remind me? Is it get rid of all managers? Yeah, I've always had a problem with that one. <laughs> um, so so this, is, this is the Uniqlo philosophy. Everybody takes on responsibility. Everyone has some authority. Everyone makes decisions. You know, we see this in Agile. We see this with programmers. Number one, self-organizing teams. Just because you shoot the manager does not mean there's less management work to do. OK, your manager does not need to talk to another manager because they both don't exist anymore. But there's still a load of stuff they were doing, which needs doing. Who's going to do it? Is all management work waste? Some is. But you know, some programmer work is waste, some tester work is waste. There's a, quite a residual amount of managerial work to do, even if you don't have managers. And if the team don't do it, the self-organizing team don't do it, it ain't going to get done. The second way that we see this is that our programmers, our teams, need to think like a business. You're all managers now. You need to be able to step into the business, which I agree. When you were writing COBOL, and when I was writing C++, it was bloody difficult to do that, because you know, the ins and outs of the C++ syntax means your brain hasn't got space for anything else. But come on, JavaScript, man. You can think like a businessman and think like a JavaScript programmer. <laughs> Tim O'Reilly, you all know his books. Um, he said this a couple of years ago. Um, a large part of the work from Amazon, Uber, etc., is performed by programs and algorithms. These programs are the workers, and the human software developers who create them are the managers. Zen in Kai Kai, you're all managers now. You all manage the bots, the machines, the AIs, all that digital stuff we're talking about. You need to think like a manager. You're all managers now. So just to be clear, here's the workers, here's the manager. Okay? I really need to ram this home. Managers, workers. Anyone know Siri? I, not myself, but people tell me she's good. And she has a friend, Alexa. Uh, um, they have a friend on Mars. Yeah. Um, not all of the workers are so friendly. Um, I just wish. Putin had used one of these from the skip holes, it would be no problem, you know. We, we don't worry about the Americans hell-firing people. Uh, yeah, so some, some of them aren't so happy, some of our workers, and, and avoid this guy. HR tell me this guy is a, don't, don't hire him. Yeah. Uh, so um, this is more proof that the future is managers. We're in, we're in a university here. Do you know this university teaches managers? These are the UK undergraduate statistics for 
first year students studying management and administration for the last five years? 18% increase over five years of entry. You may think there are no managers in the future, but the generation that is studying now think the future is management. Um, I originally wanted to get the statistics for masters in management programs. I, I couldn't find them, so this is undergraduates, but I think you'll find a similar story. More people are studying management. Management ain't going away. Management is coming everywhere. Zen and Kai Kai. Number one, learn about management. I've got to speed up because I'm on time. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, biz tech. I, I want this to be the new hashtag. I want this to move DevOps out of here, okay? Okay? Bring everyone together. Dissolve the wall. This is a historical trend. Again, Agile Conference, we have to have this diagram somewhere. Okay, so remember this? 1970, COBOL. And then Agile happened. And the first thing we did was we got rid of the architects. Programmers started designing and refactoring. Radical. Uh, and then we uh, automated testing. Yeah? Um, we did test first. Uh, and now we have DevOps. Okay. What happens next? I think BDD is proof of this. You go, go, and, go and talk to, to Liz or Seb when he's here or any of the BDD folks, and BDD is an analysis technique. BDD is pretty much example-based analysis, which has been in business analysis textbooks for a couple of decades. Right? That's what's going to happen next. Yeah? And then software requirements. I've, I've never understood that systems requirements bit, but yeah, yeah. Biz tech. We need to bring the business people and technology people together, and they need to appreciate each other. Techies need to learn about business, and the business non-techies need to learn about tech. You did, you, did you hear Radio Cornwall this morning when they did the, the, the two minutes on Agile on the Beach, and um, they made some jokes about geeks? And they read out the Wikipedia definition of agile, and, and they all had a laugh. It's still acceptable, isn't it, in society, and even for senior managers, to make fun of these unwashed people here. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're coders. Yeah, but nice business people. These, these people shower. <laughs> Could you imagine if they felt that way about the marketing department, the accounting department? Yeah? They probably feel that way about cleaning, but they outsource that. Uh, but you know, even senior managers get their heads around double entry bookkeeping, which is another relevant old technique we should get rid of. But even senior managers understand CapEx and OpEx. And they can use one of these, but they can't get their head necessarily around a lot of our technical stuff. They need to. And we as technical people need to appreciate them a bit more. It takes both sides. This is biz tech. It's all one. Everyone works as one team. Zen in Kai Kai. Think like a manager. I'll let you take the photographs. Um, Agile is a process change that accompanies digitization. If you really want a digital business, you need to change your processes as well. And I don't know exactly what your process is going to look like, but they probably look a damn sight more agile than they do now. Digital business needs to be agile business. And my four heuristics for you to take away, plan less, release more. Build a machine that can iterate and learn. Everyone's a manager. Biz tech. Wow, you've got about one minute for questions. <laughs> Can't get in the photo. This is getting bad being a presenter. It, it's all recorded, um, all those things I move about are getting in the way. Where can you buy my book? Well, at the moment it's on Lean Pub, but it'll be on Amazon soon. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Go. On. So basically, the results I, uh, I can show on that sort of process for all the uh, uh, regards to Agile, which is essentially that's what that is. Is will there be Agile Summit uh, which can teach an Agile process, if you will, and thereby can build up develop beyond that? Probably. So, so I think one of the one of the secrets, or not so secrets, but one of the difficult agile is agile contains that thing every good programmer hates, self-modifying code. Agile contains within itself the ability to change itself, 
I was talking about this with the, the ABC guys this morning, you know, that the moment we can confine agile and we define what it is, you're kind of new to it. Because when you define it, when you pin it down too closely, and this is one of the reasons I don't like Scrum certification, you, you stop it changing. But because Agile actually contains the DNA, the self-modifying code that allows you to change it and extend it, one would hope that evolutionary style, Darwin style, that it would just mutate into something else. And at some point we might say that that Homo sapien is not a gorilla. <laughs> you know, they're, they're kind of the same, the, the humans and the, the gorillas, but they're kind of different. But where, where do you put that? Like, maybe there will be we'll look back and we'll say the Agile of 2016 was, or 2018, was Neanderthal Agile. And, and we now, in, in 2056, do Homo sapiens, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it, it should modify it. If it's not, so one of my standard lines is, um, you, um, if you're doing Agile correctly, you should be changing it all the time. The only thing you can do wrong in Agile is do it the same as you did three months ago. So I'd hope it evolves, but quite possibly we change the name at some point. I'm around for the rest of the conference. I'll be on the beach. I'm not coming on the boat, but please ask questions. Who's up next? Who? Ah, sorry. <laughs> While we do a quick swap, stay in your seats. <laughs>